Knowledge is power. And this is powerful stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the Weekend Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. Now, let's fire up the News Hour. Here is the Weekend Radio Team. Welcome to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. I'm your host, Kurt Dukach. Today in the studio, I have Michael McCullough. Hello. Perry Haichu. And our guest today is Michelle Fiore. Hello. So, um, Got to start off today's uh, broadcast with, uh, with a disclaimer that uh, the views and opinions on today's show are strictly that of the guests. We Can does not endorse any candidate. We are here to simply educate you about cannabis and the use. So um, today we're broadcasting live from Worldwide Digital Broadcasting Studios, our new home. So hope you guys like the quality out there. This is much better and we're going to have a lot of fun. So, uh, okay. So well, then, let's start off. Perry, you, you have an, an interesting story that's a local story. So uh, let, let's head off with yeah, that. Yes, one. sir. Um, I came across something along my Facebook thread this morning and it said it was basically a long time a uh, casino worker has been fired after taking his medical marijuana for a disability. The disability was not stated in the article, but basically what ended up happening was this gentleman has been employed as a, as a surveillance tech at the Plaza Hotel downtown for over a decade. He survived the management change recently, and he came down with the condition that necessitated his use of medical cannabis starting in 2012 mm -hmm. and he did not make the company aware of it at that time and uh, he according to the story he brought up to the attention of management that there was asbestos in the building so in response to that or so the story goes they drug tested him and of course he showed up for mar marijuana presented his medical marijuana card and they fired him so he he went to the news and he's trying to put the story out there to see to see what's going on and of course you know um nrs 453a as we were just talking about doesn't really protect employees or the guess i guess the way i should put it is it doesn't force employers to make respect yeah to make an accommodation for medical marijuana in the workplace and their drug testing statutes even though i think that they should uh so it's just another in a long line of people lately who have been telling this story and it's been going on for years since it really became uh since people started really registering for the program a few years ago and it's going to continue to be an issue until we eventually clear it up in legislature so and as we know nevada is an an at-will state uh, to work and employers can terminate for any or, or almost no reason but um i can't imagine that if this person had tested positive for opioids with a prescription or almost anything else that they would have been terminated and it seems that the legislature made this loophole when they passed this bill and why do you think that is michelle you, you were up there i was i actually passed the bill so um it, there's a lot of loopholes in uh, legislation this particular piece of legislation is going to continually get amended each session um the biggest issue that i have with this piece of legislation is the firearm clause in it mm -hmm. so um i think that um a lot of folks aren't getting their medical marijuana card if they're a Second Amendment individual because they don't want to give up their firearm. And so when I think about that, I think about, well, you don't have to give up your firearm if you're on Lortab or Oxycontin or alcohol or any other you know, prescription medication. So you definitely shouldn't have to give up your firearm. Um, because you are using marijuana in a medical way. Mm -hmm. Well, um, when the police arrest someone uh, on marijuana charges and there is a <coughs> firearm present, uh, they add on the charge of NO, uh, NRS 202.360, which is unauthorized person in possession of a firearm. And, and the, the clause that they use in that is that uh, someone who is addicted to a substance cannot have a firearm on the state of laws of Nevada. And so the police are making the argument that just because someone registers as a patient and uses cannabis medicinally, that they are an addict. And to me, that's a big rush. Oh, absolutely. I was denied the purchase of a firearm at the gun store on uh, East Tropicana about a year and a half ago, a beautiful Ruger that I wanted. And <clears throat> I basically had to drag it out of the guy. He wouldn't, wouldn't tell me. He refused. I, I almost had to threaten him with legal action to try to get him to tell me, hey, look, you know, it was... It was your weed card that that prevented you from getting it, and I just kind of threw my hands up in frustration at that point because I realized I was I was in trouble. Of course, when I went to re-register my concealed weapons permit later that year, 
same story. Under Sheriff came out. He's just like, look, this is the way it's got to be. You can have one or the other. And the so is, that was not, easy. This is not a federal issue. This is a, this is a state level issue. That's well, uh, they try to kick it up though. They always yeah. kind of hide behind that shield. They're like, oh, you know, there's nothing we can do. But really, it's all about the local. I, I guess it would be the sheriff and his uh, and his board. I don't know what they call themselves, but the the board of directors of the the sheriff, uh, the police department here, or whoever they are that are making these policy decisions. And uh, it, it's really disappointing that we are disallowed from that because now I have only one option, which is to open carry if I choose to, mm -hmm. which I don't particularly enjoy. It, it ruins my element of surprise, which is what being concealed is all about, is not being so publicly offensive. I mean, I could choose to do that and carry my six-inch cold python on my hip if I wanted to, but it doesn't make me any friends, so I choose not to, and I try not to draw <laughs> that attention. So, you know, it's just one of those things. So oh. I, I would love to be able to quietly, discreetly protect myself once again. Right, because the element of surprise there is, is everything. Absolutely. Once, if you're open carrying and someone is targeting you, they're, they're going to target you and target that weapon very quickly. Absolutely. This is very similar to those two uh, police officers who got killed in the CC's Pizza, and the one guy, they ran into the Walmart, and the one guy tried to draw his gun out, ended up getting shot in the back of the head. That story isn't so often told. It's because he was, you know... He put himself out there, and it, and it went down. I don't know if it was a concealed versus a open carry thing, but it's just another, you know, just that that second of uh, like a surprise cost him his life, unfortunately. So, being in the in the legislature, Michelle, um, where do you think that that this mindset comes from? Are there are are the people up in the legislature just convinced that anyone? who uses pot is is a drug addled zombie or something no i think what we have is we have a huge issue with people that are legislators that think that they know better than the people so um as a responsible adult i think we need to preach responsibility and i think that um, my peers our fellow legislators here um have to uh let us take responsibility for our lives. I really see all of this um, as more of a revenue generating resource for them because until we um, decriminalize uh, marijuana, my big, big issue is justice reform. And this is exactly the things I'm talking about. When they have all of this legislation on the books, it gives probable cause for people to break in your house and, mm -hmm. and arrest you, and then if you have a firearm, it's more charges. All of this is prisons for profit. It mm -hmm. all, I'm sorry to say, but it's all connected. This is why marijuana needs to be legal to where we take out the element to where they can use legislation against a responsible citizen for responsibly smoking. So that, again, I don't, I'm not a smoker or a marijuana user however i am pro justice reform and unless we reform our marijuana legislation it's a constant uh, revenue generator and these prisons are are full with victimless violentless crimes that have to do with marijuana let, let me ask you about prisons um it, my own feeling is that uh Keeping people housed in prisons and rehabilitating them is part of the the public burden that we that we have to share when we're put when we're incarcerating people. And yet there's a bigger trend to go to private for-profit prisons. Uh, and uh, the facility in Pahrump, uh, which is a CCA facility, I understand charges something on the order, uh, charges the state uh, $142 a day for a prisoner, which, and those those costs mount up very, very quickly and, and are far more expensive than the average $30,000 a year or so that, that the state system has. So how, how do you come down on that, the, the, the public or private side of that? Well, first of all, um, the private prisons, and it's not $142 a day, it's $144 a day. Pardon so <laughs> Inflation. Inflation. Yeah. So um, oh it's a huge issue. I want all the private prisons shut down. I mean, and I'm telling you, as a Republican, people go, oh, my God, she's a Republican. Yes, I'm a responsible Republican. Um, I really feel, um, and actually, now that I've started visiting these prisons mm -hmm. because even though I have fought for justice reform for the past five years, I'm actually now visiting incarcerated individuals that have not been convicted yet, but yet they are treated in society today as mm -hmm. they are guilty 
and mm-hmm. and they are not presumed innocent. They are guilty, um, and they have to prove their innocence. And for the most part, it's very difficult for someone to prove their innocence when they're incarcerated, to where they don't have access to the stuff they need to to help their attorneys mm-hmm. with evidence, with discovery. Uh, it is the it is the worst and the saddest and the most corrupt system that I have uh, now started, my eyes are wide open and um, and now, you know, part of my legislative career is to shut prisons down, the prisons for profit down. I want anyone that is in prison with a victimless and violentless crime, I want them out at home and if they really need to be monitored, put a bracelet on them. I, I met an individual who is serving a, a year in federal prison for Medicare fraud. And whether he did it or not is not the issue. For me, the thought that this guy who was 60 years old or so and had been, uh, he was an oncologist and and working as a doctor for decades, the idea that you put him in jail for this, I think it would have better served the community to force him to work 40 or 60 hours a week in a, in a clinic where he was taking care of actual sick People. Because of his skill set. Because of his skill set. Yeah, I mean, there was a time I'm, when I was growing up that when you got in trouble for drugs, they made you do public service. Mm-hmm. That was that was the punishment. Remember all the PSAs that they used to put out from all the famous people that got caught, you know, with a little bit of marijuana or something. That was their punishment. Now we lock them up instead of having them. Try well, to do there's a lot better. of money in it. The director of uh, the Corrections Corporation of America (CCA), the largest private prison corporation in in the world, or at least in this country. Um, he drives a new exotic car every day to work. I have a friend in Alaska who who uh, works for the federal probation system up there and tells me all about it. And it's just like you know, Rolls Royce on Monday for our on Tuesday and this and that. And this is what our tax dollars are subsidizing or extravagant lifestyles by boards of directors that are running private companies. And it's just as simple as that. You, know, you better believe they're given, you know, um, like stock options to each other and like all kinds of fun stuff that people on publicly traded boards of directors do and their stock does well. And well, understand on these prison private, these uh, prisons for profit and even let me tell you, even our public prisons, they're for profit too and I'll explain why. Oh, slave these labor. private prisons that we have for profit that are charging an exorbitant amount, um, they are, their contracts with each state um, basically, the states guarantee them that they will be at like almost full capacity. Mm-hmm. So then that's why in the state of Nevada, you have our probation, um, our um, parole, and our, and our prisons that don't know what one hand is doing with the other. And so they're very confused. They're very disorganized. There's 37 states that have everything, you know, under one roof. So the parole and probation officer can talk to the guards and, you know, and they work together, not here in Nevada. So besides the contracts that are exorbitant, now here, let's go to the public prisons. When I toured the Clark County Detention Center, you know, their capacity was only, I don't know, 2,000 something that it was supposed to be. I toured that place and there was cots like in the middle of the block and stuff and I said, you know, is this like cleanup time or whatever. It was, it was like you were in um, a daycare and the kids were about to do nappy time because there was like cots <laughs> everywhere. and so. They're like, no, they're just overcrowded. And so, and you, and when I think about that, and the whole thing that really got me hot on what the hell is going on in our uh, jails, in our city jails, in our county jails, in our prisons, um, is one of my constituents in, in AD4, um, I won't say his name because it's embarrassing, but he uh, is a principal of a school, and he got pulled over on Lone Mountain in 215 for speeding and there was a warrant out for his arrest and because the officer ran his plate he couldn't let him go he had mm-hmm. to arrest him and um, the, the ticket was paid his wife is a nurse over at Centennial Hills Hospital where my grandson was born and the and they paid the ticket two years prior they didn't update the system and when I was in legislation there was 875,000 not 875 not 875,000 on processed tickets DNA rape kits all of this on you know inputted in the computer so meanwhile there's so many warrants out for folks arrest that these tickets were paid for now thank goodness and let me tell you what a difficult the wife thought he was missing because when they um, detained him they took all of his stuff away they took his phone they took all of his stuff away and then they said you can call your wife 
But he only knew to press one on his phone to call his wife. Mm -hmm. So then it took another three or four hours for them to kindly go get his phone, get the phone number, write it on a piece of paper so then he could use whatever service phones that they have in, in the jails. But this is pathetic, uh, unwarranted. It took them 14 or 15 hours to get him out and then come to find out once someone's detained and as long as you hit that 14 hour mark, the state or the private prison gets the gets is able to bill mm -hmm. for the full day for the twenty. So they make sure that they keep somebody in yes, for that amount. For oh, minimally that absolutely. time. Absolutely. And then so when you think about that, you know, um, and and if you go on my website, which is votefury.com, and you review some of my um, videos that I have back from the 2013 session and um, and the 2014 era you will see judges, Judge Hardesty in particular, literally tell me on video, yes, it's horrible, we do have to stop using our jails as a collection agency, but we haven't figured it out yet. Yes, I did figure it out. In this state, we need to change criminal infractions to civil penalties, as 37 other states do. However, the judges are the ones that came into my Judiciary Committee and opposed the bill because they were afraid they weren't going to be able to collect the fines, which wow. is totally not true. And all of this, so trust but verify what I say, all of this is on my website at votefiori.com. Very Reagan of you. But this is just American exceptionalism. We are number one in the world in incarcerated yes. persons. We're, we're, yeah. We have, we incarcerated five times the, the world average, and are we're we not five times more. Yeah, are we that criminalistic of a society? I thought we were the greatest country in the world, the freest country in the world. That's what I was growing up. And, and, you know, that's you what know, they told me when I was growing up. You're looking to go into Congress now, and, and I saw uh, that there was a congressman just in the past few days who said America's problem is not over incarceration it's under incarceration yeah we I need saw to that lock more people okay up. so that guy whoever that guy is this is why we <laughs> have to get involved because mm -hmm. that guy needs to lose his next election mm -hmm. and I don't care if he's not in this state but people that not. understand justice reform we need to send mailers out from Nevada to his district and say look this is, and let me tell you, there's four of us sitting at the table. One out of every four Americans, and I'm going to give you these numbers. And again, Reaganize, mm -hmm. trust but verify. So we have 2.7 million convicted, incarcerated, mm -hmm. you know, out of 340 million in America. However, we have over 3,000 county jails, uh, ca counties in America, okay? So, and there's some counties that have two, three, four, five jails. Well, let's be conservative. Let's just say each county has a jail, okay? So we'll say 3,000 county jails. That's not including city jails or state prisons. <laughs> Give you a, for instance, in LA, LA County Jail, they'll house over 10,000 incarcerated, not convicted, waiting to be convicted, incarcerated individuals. So I want you to take that number, times it by 3,000, and we'll bring it down to, let's say, 3,000, okay? Here in Nevada, we have four, okay? That's nine to 10 million folks, mm -hmm. million. And when I say nine to 10 million, if you do your research and you do your research and you do your research, you're gonna come back to me and you're gonna go, Michelle, I'm sorry, you were wrong. It's like 16 million, mm -hmm. but let's just bring it to a conservative number, okay? 10 million folks incarcerated, not convicted out of 340 million people. That's not including the 2.7 million that are convicted. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is not okay. United States of America incarcerates more than Russia and China, all of their jails combined. This is what we're doing to America. So, Amer you know, people, you know, flock to our country thinking, you know, this is the place of freedom. Well, what I'm going to tell you, the reason why I've made my career uh, to be in politics and to be in, in the legislature is to change the laws because the government is free to do whatever it wants. You and I are not. So out of the four of us here, the statistics say it, minimally one of us has either been in jail or will be in jail. Uh, that, that would be me. Yeah, we're, we've got Absolutely. A I've, on I've it, been so. to jail, sure. Oh, so there's more. I've been, I, I, I've been to jail okay. in three so, different states for marijuana okay. possession. So yeah. 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 We're going to take a break. We're going to go to our first commercial break make sure you check out our sponsors here these are the people that make this show possible so make sure you go into their places and check them out and we'll be back with some more news with michelle Fiore. you're listening to the weekend 702 nevada cannabis news hour now here again the weekend radio team welcome back to the nevada cannabis news hour uh today in the studio where we have our guest michelle fiori so 
And and you know to continue on with uh, what we we're saying for criminal justice for a moment, there there's a story that that comes out of North Carolina in which uh, uh, in a sharp turn from the war on drugs, the police chief in Nashville, North Carolina, announced in February that drug addicts in his small town would be taken to rehabilitation centers instead of jail. And now, in response to a growing opioid crisis across the state and the nation, the chief is calling on other law enforcement uh, officers across the state to do the same thing. And and I think that that is a great step forward. And it's not a legislative change. It is not an official policy. But here's a common sense solution coming from conservative middle America that we can't keep locking people up at this rate. That's correct. So here's the big problem, though. So about 21 years ago, here in our state, because you know I like what they're doing in the Carolinas, but here in our state, they shut down a lot of our facilities. They shut down a lot of our mental rehabilitational mm -hmm. facilities. And so with that, they all of a sudden um, combined the, the mental wards in the jails. So now they're just taking folks to jail. And now here's another crisis. When we look at the jail budget, when we look at our public safety budget, we spend more money incarcerating folks than we do on educating our children. This is why. It's not just $144 a day. Then if you get incarcerated and you're on medication or you're acting out and they want to medicate you, um, if you have your inhaler, don't forget when you get incarcerated, you don't get to bring your stuff with you. So if you're a diabetic, if you have high blood pressure, if you have a heart condition, all of those meds, now they have to dispense to you. And, and, and unfortunately, the way they have them packaged, if you're there for a day, but they had to open up a package of four, um, they waste the other three pills, and the taxpayer pays for that. So I like what the Carolinas are doing. However, in order for us to follow suit, we would have to have facilities to take them to. And, and so, you know, you're running for Congress now, but you're talking about all these changes that are needed in the state. Um, how can you leave us in such a lurch when, when we need this help in Carson City? Well, here's the biggest issue. So as I served two terms in Carson City and two special sessions, and I sat on nine different committees, all of the legislation that would come before me, the majority, they would say, we have to pass this law, Michael, because if we don't, we're not going to get matching federal funds. Mm -hmm. So they have Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. dictating and controlling Nevada, and that is not okay. That is why I want to go to Carson's, uh, to, to, to Congress. Yeah, to Washington. And, and, you know, there, obviously what you're talking about are federalists policies and Nevadans have have historically had a, a great mistrust of the federal government uh, but in what you're telling us mm -hmm. uh, here that uh, there's a good grounding for that mistrust of what's mm -hmm. going on in DC oh without a sh without a doubt without a shadow of a doubt I mean some of the issues that we fought for diligently this session and let me tell you passed unanimously in both houses. I'm going to tell you, Senator Tick Sigerblum and I work fabulous together on many issues, uh, from justice reform to the marijuana issue. Um, this past session, we had a bill, it was SB 99, it was um, to remove the federal statutes um, from AB 579 that happened eight years ago on sex offenders, keeping all the sex offenders at their own tier, tier one, tier two, tier three. So a tier one sex offender, it's someone that moons someone or streaks. A tier three sex offender is someone that raped, killed a child. You know, it's, it's a bad thing. However, matching the federal Adam Walsh Act, they put all the tiers into one. Now all of a sudden, if you're a high school kid and you streaked across the field, now you have to register as a sex offender for the rest of your life because oh. you're as equal as the, as the oh, tier three. Man. Now, if you've ever had uh, a lewdness charge or any kind of sex charge on you, besides registering now, your neighbors are going to get postcards now everyone knows what you drive so instead of me getting a postcard saying oh michael lives next door to you and he's a sex offender they don't say michael lives next door to you and he mooned his wife okay they don't say that so and so understand the issues that we're having and then also understand that any of these sex crimes tier one tier two tier three that happened from 1950 and on so if someone if there's a 77 year old guy that you know flashed someone back in 1950 and if he's still alive he's registering starting october of this year that is disgusting and i want you to understand Tick Sigerbloom and I sponsored that legislation. We had unanimous vote in the chambers and assembly, unanimous chambers and senate to keep it separate, to keep DC out of us. What does our governor do? 
vetoes yeah. the bill. Okay, it's a problem. It's a big problem. I, I saw the same thing in the last session where um, uh, the governor's wife had a, a pet project to get um, uh, a very restrictive opiate bill passed. And um, at the urging of, of one of my doctors, I went up and I, I testified against this. And, and opioid uh, abuse is a huge problem in this country. There's no doubt about it. Yet you're, by restricting the access to that, you are condemning these chronic pain patients, the legitimate patients, you're condemning them to a, a horrible life filled with pain because we can't wrap our hands around this situation in other ways. So and that thing have, just got ramrodded right through. So now we have non-elected people dictating legislation. Well, in, in the form of the, the governor's wife, yes. She, she led great. the charge on that, and, and pretty much everybody fell in line behind her. And, That's the way and, I understand and yes, it. Yes, opioid abuse is a terrible scourge in this, in this country. And yet, and yet, Congress just passed a, a, a bill uh, on a rules committee uh, for, uh, for the opioid bill to, to prevent uh, opioid abuse, but they're preventing cannabis research as a least harm method. And having been involved in this movement for years, I know any number of people who have stopped their opioid use by using cannabis, and it's been very effective. But does that mean that they should be automatically and immediately cut off from their opioid medication at the discovery that they're using medical cannabis? No, which it, is kind it just of makes it much harder for the doctor because they're they're forcing the they've set up a state database that monitors how many prescriptions a doctor is writing. Okay, and, and so they're saying if you're in the the top five percent or or whatever that you know all of a sudden you're under increased state scrutiny well if you're an oncologist treating terminal cancer patients you're gonna have a higher than average number of, of um, painkiller recommendations so they're targeting the doctors now yes and they want to kind of put the squeeze on them exactly kind of stop it at the source supposedly. and all that's going to do really mm -hmm. is is take uh, the expensive uh, industrial pharmaceuticals and make them not available to people and so a number of those people are going to turn to the street where they can pick up heroin for a tenth of the cost and now we have a real problem and we're we're seeing that here in Nevada we've had an increase a few articles I've seen now we've had a, a, a a r real spike in the heroin use and the abuse of heroin in Nevada. I think it's really misreported. I saw something about that today on the news. They were like, oh, you know, there's all these heroin things. And I've lost a couple of friends of mine to heroin use, the young people. One when he was 18, one when he was 26. It was, it was terrible. And uh, when the certificate of death came, the cause of death was not drug abuse or drug addiction or what do they call that overdose, overdose. it was uh, like asphyxiation due to this or the other but they always misreport that because that was the actual cause of death is okay he choked to death but why mm -hmm. why did he cho it was obviously the drugs he was taking but I feel like I'm not exactly sure why but these statistics are not reported accurately a lot of the time and I am almost wondering whether it's done purposefully or whether it's done purely scientifically whether you know this was the specific cause of death but there's no underlying reasoning behind it so when they're addressing these spikes it's much worse than it's actually being reported mm -hmm. and so I'm just curious as to why they're not putting that down maybe it's a policy thing or it's an individual hospital decision or I don't know why I think because um, again, our legislators and the different agencies believe that Americans can't handle the truth. So if people actually understood that people were dying from overdosing on drugs, that would be a, a, an alarm. That would be definitely cause to be alarmed. So when you look at even our crime statistics, they're skewed. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're just skewed. Why? Because when you look at stats, you have to have these stats in a balanced order so um, the agencies uh, and the paperwork is stringent so they are taught that how to how to write a death certificate mm -hmm. up and it should definitely be the truth so I, I can tell that you've got a passion for this and I'd like to explore a, a little bit more about where that came from you and I apparently grew up across the Verrazano Bridge from each other right. myself on Staten Island you mm -hmm. in Brooklyn mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's odd because Staten Island's a Republican stronghold and Brooklyn is a Democratic oh, I know, stronghold I know. And, but, but we're reversed there so how, yeah. how did a good Brooklyn girl like you turn into a Republican and get so passionate about politics um, well I'll tell you I wasn't always passionate about politics but when I started 
started learning that these hayseeds, uh, and you know, I'm talking about legislators in Carson City, were creating legislation that involved, you know, overburdensome regulation, overburdensome taxation, these fees, these, I mean, just horrific things. At first, I thought to myself, gosh, these guys must have their PhD in, you know, economics. I mean, they really must know what they're doing, but even though they're killing, you know, little guys. So then when I found out that at the time that I got passionate about politics, that my state senator who implemented the MBT tax was an ambulance driver and he never signed the front of a paycheck, um, I thought to myself, oh, okay, so these guys that are writing legislation don't walk in the people's shoes that they're affecting, um, and that's an issue. So then I started doing my research on who the hell is in the legislature. We've got a waitress, we've got an ambulance driver, a real estate agent. It's a citizen legislature. And that's not bad in itself. It's not no. bad in itself, but at the same time, it's not balanced. So you have folks that, you know, if, for instance, I don't know a lot about marijuana, okay? So I doubt you want me making you uh, marijuana soap or marijuana soap. I don't know about it, okay? So, <laughs> so I just think that we need more folks when they're writing legislation to actually wear the folks' shoes that they're writing the legislation that it will affect. You know, and it's, it's interesting. I've, I've been saying for a few years about the legislature up there that you talk to 90%, to you talk to everybody with tick, mm -hmm. and, and they'll say, oh, I've never smoked marijuana. I don't know anybody who smokes marijuana. In fact, I don't even know anything about marijuana. Mm -hmm. So. Let's start passing some laws about it. That's right. That's right. So let me tell you what Tick says. Tick says, Tick's, <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's so ticklish. Um, but Tick, when we, were, um, when we were touring uh, the facilities, Tick was like, wow, those are a great butt. I mean, Tick will, you know, Tick has his own strand after him now. Yes. Yes. I mean, Sigur so, Bloom Hayes. Sigur Bloom Hayes, yes. And so, um, um, there was, you sent me a photo called Bella Fiore, a strand of Bella Fiore. Someone sent me a strand of Bella Fiore. And, uh, and I think that, um, again, because, because I don't know a lot about marijuana and what I'm learning about it, this is what I know about it. I have friends that smoke it and they're successful and they're fine and they're responsible adults. Is it medical? Probably not. However, um, when my friends smoked it 20 years ago, 30 years ago, they weren't getting tested in labs and they weren't doing any of this stuff. And there's a lot of um, marijuana that, um, you know, before medical marijuana came in use and now we have all of these great organic, you know, vitamin waters and dirts and, you know, the really nice way to grow marijuana. I'm just wondering to myself, is there really a difference between the Mexican weed or the vitamin C marijuana. The bottom line is, when you look at it, are, is the industry overregulated? Because again, they're gouging and they're uh, making legislation, and it's profiting the state. Or is there something to it? I, as what I'm seeing as a legislator, is this business in the state of Nevada. There's no other business that has been regulated and gouged as much as this business. Not the alcohol business, not the casino industry, not the gambling, not even prostitution. No. I mean, you know. I could open so, a whorehouse much easier than a Yeah, than you a can definitely open. I'm thinking, shoot, I might as well open up the cock ranch instead of the chicken ranch, you there know? You I mean, just saying. So, but what I'm saying, you, you know, you think about these things and why is it? Why is it that the legislatures have become quite unfair to this industry? Uh, that's, that's a good question. It's mostly, I think, because of the, the hippie stoner stereotype. And, and this uh, Nevada has always been a hippies versus cowboys type of environment. So I, I think that's a lot about it. But I'd like to touch back on something that you said just a little earlier, which was that uh, you know these legislators are adding fees and, and mm -hmm. doing all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and normally, uh, from someone on your side of the aisle, I, I, you would be pointing your finger over to Democrats. Um, but I really see it happening on both sides because um, your, your main opponent in the upcoming primary mm -hmm. uh, got himself elected uh, on essentially a no taxes oh, pledge. Oh, Lord, I know. And, and then, uh, you know, helped pass the largest uh, tax increase in the history <laughs> yeah. of the state. Now, right after we voted against it in the uh, Ford, Ford 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 initiative, yeah. Yeah, and, and the thing is that 
even though uh, everything that I hear is that he's very unpopular with the base because of that, the party seems to still be supporting yes. him, making him the fair-haired boy. And uh, I think mm. the other people who are running in the primary are, are are just lesser candidates. And but but with him, he's amassed this big war chest. And and after after abandoning his base, I, I don't understand it. You know, and and I have to tell you, you know, you think about. The, that opponent, we're talking about Senator Majority Leader Michael Roberson, yes, who did are. basically push through the largest tax hike um, in the state's history in 50 years. Um, and he did promise and he did um, sign the tax protection uh, pledge that he wasn't going to. However, again, these legislators, I don't know what happens when they leave Clark County and they get up to the north. All of a sudden they forget about their constituents. They forget about their promises. Or they come to the conclusion that, oh my, I am a state representative now and I know a whole hell of a lot better uh, what's good for my constituents than I did before I was elected. Um, that basically tells me he got a lot of fat checks from lobbyists that say this is what we need you to do because a lot of folks are under the misconception that we have three branches of government. We have our executive branch which is Brian Sandoval's office, then we have the legislature branch which they call us the gang of 63, 21 state senators and 43 leg assembly people, and then we have the judicial branch. But no one wants to talk about the lobbying branch and the lobbyist and 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 who writes the checks I mean when we're up at the legislature for the four or five months we have lobbyists pushing their bills through the majority of the over a thousand bills that I read they were all sponsored by a lobbyist putting it in the hands of a legislator saying I need you to do this and meanwhile while they're campaigning this is how it goes this company will come and say listen I can max out to you for 10,000 here's the legislation I need you to represent okay that branch. And so the legislator, they're like, okay, great, 10,000, that'll get me, you know, a mailer, that'll get me yard signs, you know, forget it. There's been twice that I've literally sent lobbyists back their checks and said, you're not allowed in my office, take your money and go to charm school because you're obnoxious. And, um, and so I would prefer um, to vote for our next generation than my next election. So yes, I fundraise. Yes, I ask people for dollars uh, to buy those signs, but no, my vote's just not up for sale. And, and you know, it, it's a situation where this happens on both sides of the mm -hmm. aisle. It's, it's without not one a doubt. Party or, or without a own. doubt. You know, but I, I'm familiar in one case with uh, uh, Alec, which is a very conservative uh, legislative council. Uh, and what they're doing is they take these bills and they pre-write them, and then they find their anointed representatives in every state house, mm -hmm. and they say, "Here's the bill we want you to pass." Mm -hmm. And it does happen on both mm -hmm. sides. And oh, without it a doubt, shouldn't happen on either. Well, so uh, I guess we need to take another break and, and you know, but this is fascinating conversation. Yes, it's fun. It's fun. So we're going to take a break and we'll be right back. And we're Welcome back. back. All right. Let, and Michelle, let me ask you, you're, you're talking about fundraising and we see how the lobbying industry uh, really controls a lot of the legislative agenda. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about uh, public financing of campaigns and uh, there, there's a lot of difference as, as to whether the people should pay for this but to my mind it sort of levels the playing field and and from what I have heard from people who are in office the single thing they hate the most about being in office is uh, in being in office is that they get locked away in a room room and they have to make fundraising calls and do this for hours a day sometimes uh, so where do you stand on this issue on public financing. So public financing is a big problem and this is why Michael because all of a sudden if we use taxpayers dollars to you know basically supplement our campaign mm -hmm. the richest man wins and this is why because the one with the most money they'll take the public donations and then they'll spend their own money behind mm -hmm. the scenes so that makes it a total um, unequal level playing field wh however you're going to write that so. So but is that more unequal than the playing field we have now? Because we're already in a, in a situation where the wealthy can, can raise everything that they want with super PACs uh, that are not supposed to coordinate, but they kind of do in many cases. Uh, <laughs> you know, so obviously, obviously it's a thorny issue then, and there's no easy solution. There's, it's a very thorny issue, and there's no easy solution at all on this particular. Because I think to myself, 
I have to call and ask for my supporters to say, hey, you know, I need to do the sign. And then when you have, you know, other folks that are in the race that are conservative or whatever and, and our base is the same, it really makes it difficult to to do that. So, again, it's very, um, it's a, it's just a very difficult situation. And this is something I just don't see being fixed anytime soon. Hmm. Well, then... Uh, as for things that can be fixed, if you were to get into Congress, uh, where do you come in on the issue of rescheduling or descheduling cannabis? Are you uh, are are you more with Bernie to to deschedule it entirely, or are you more with Hillary to move it to schedule two? Or well, Donald changes his position a lot, so I'm not really sure. But where do you stand on cannabis? I stand with Bernie on this. Number one, it needs to be descheduled. Period. It just it needs to be descheduled, and why? Simply again, it goes back to justice reform. I'm sorry, but it is responsible adults, and no matter people say, well, if you you know if it's so easily uh, accessible, then kids are gonna you know do it. Listen, kids are gonna do what kids are gonna do. Adults are gonna do what adults are gonna do. Again, yeah. it's back to being a responsible human being. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're a responsible. Democrat, a Republican, independent, libertarian, be responsible, period. And that's what it's going to take. And let me tell you, I'm going to start harping on this because I never have, but I'm going to start harping on being responsible about voting. I don't care who you vote for. I don't care if you vote against me, okay? If you don't vote, shame on you. If you're sitting here listening to the problems that we're having and you turn around and this is what I hear, oh, the system's corrupt and you know no one's gonna fix it. It's corrupt because you're not involved. Mm -hmm. It's corrupt because you're not spending your time at that voting booth. It's corrupt because of you. The people that don't vote allow the system to be corrupt and that's just the facts. I think in the 2014 election, something like 14% of voters Yeah, it was a disgusting voted. number. Voted. Yeah. You know, which for those of us who do vote, it means our vote counts seven times as much. Do you yeah. believe you know. that election day should be a national holiday? Yes. I would vote for that. I would vote for that also. I would yeah. vote for that, absolutely. I and here's the thing, everyone has to vote. Yeah. You know, everyone you know, you're well, gonna take the day off from work, you better bring your I voted yeah. sticker. Well back. that's yeah. the whole thing yeah. is there I saw a little internet meme and it, people are complaining like, Oh, I can't uh can't go to work, you know, I, I gotta go to work, it's a t on a Tuesday or or whatever. Yeah. And then of course, you know, if an iPhone were to be released on a Tuesday, you better believe the crowds would be out the door. So it's just a matter of what do you make time and, for? And now what's we, important now to you? We have, now we have early voting, and it's, it's, you don't have to take that day. I mean, okay. you, got, you well, got the month before to find a day to go to. Well, they have them in, in the, at the grocery store. So should yeah. we go follow you know? Oregon and <laughs> automatically register everyone to vote that goes through the DMV automatically? Yeah. And, they, and they have uh, voting by mail right. as well. Mm -hmm. So do you think that these are good solutions? I like um, the voting by mail because understand I was in the healthcare industry for a long time and a lot of my patients were bedridden so their only option was to okay. vote by mail. Um, so I like voting by mail for, for, and you know, and you actually when you look at the voter registration and you look at the year, the, the birth year of the people that are voting by mail, they're generally 70 plus. And, and I feel like I've got to point this out because um, you are so not a standard Republican <laughs> on, on this. You know, you can look at voting reform and what's happening across the country, and in many conservative states uh, that are that are Republican ruled, uh, they're looking to limit access to the polls because smaller uh, elections with a largely white electorate are are going to be better for the Republican Party. And and the idea of of really having everybody vote seems to be uh, more in favor. Oregon is a very blue state, and yet I. I've got to commend you on this. I, I absolutely agree. It's it's the right and the responsibility of every American to be out there of voting age and vote in every election. Yeah, yes. that's a job. But yes. so what? It's mm -hmm. crucial for the voters to be educated at the same time, though. When you have people, when I was doing voter registration back before I was working for you during some of these uh, campaigns, you would have people walk straight up and just be like, "Obama, he's the Republican, right?" It's just like, "Yeah, sure, dude, check that box." At that point, like yeah. you know, what I, and it's just people are so. Yeah. Clueless. Yeah, they well. don't care. And it's well, just, it's hard to say, oh, we should have, on the flip side of that, we should just have everyone vote when you have a disproportionate amount of people who have no no knowledge of the process and are they believe what they're told to believe. So when they're told to believe something and a vast majority of the population is told you should vote for this party because of the following and vote right down the ticket, 
that's a problem also right. on both sides. It, it really is, and I think it, it addresses back to education, mm -hmm. where you need to, uh, in junior high school and in high school, uh, in civics classes, teach people, teach the, the kids the sure. importance of voting and how to do this. Let, let me just ask you also before we go, you know, being from New York City, you, I, Donald Trump, we, yeah. we speak our mind a we lot. Do, we and, do. and it gets all of us in it's, trouble. It always get, my vernacular gets me in more trouble than so I So do you it. think that Nevada is ready for a, for a straight talk and blunt <laughs> forward person in the halls of Congress? I do, and I think we need it because Nevada, um, we're a little well, uh, well Little bit a little too much behaved here and I think that um, the freedom of speech and uh, the truth to the voters have to commingle because um, always making sure your hair is in place and you smile and shake hands and kiss the babies just isn't cutting it anymore the people need a real honest down-to-earth representative that will represent them all of them um, and not just a party well, speaking of that, you broke with your caucus in 2013 and voted for our medical marijuana bill. And I you did. were the deciding vote of that. And, you know, I, I was a proud Republican until that day when I saw my caucus turn against what I thought was a very hard fought, negotiated bill at the last second due to, I, I, I don't want to put it out there because I wasn't really in those Pharmaceutical back rooms, industry yeah, money. Were, yeah, lobbyists. there was some money that came in at the last minute that damn near killed our bill if it wasn't for you. And I, you know, I just need the the cannabis, uh, the medical cannabis supporters that watch this show to remember that mm -hmm. when they're going to the polls, you know, <laughs> yes. how easily people forget the "What have you done for me lately?" is so often. But you mm -hmm. know, we cannot forget that fateful day. Why did you break with the caucus that day? Why did why weren't you a good soldier that day? Um, so I generally break with my caucus because I only vote with the people. So a lot of people have to understand that when I vote, it is for our next generation. It is not for my next election. That was a very um, combative vote. And when I say combative, I mean, I was in my caucus room fighting with my fellow Republican members and them basically telling me, if I pass this bill, because it's my one vote, my one vote will pass medical marijuana in the state of Nevada. And if I do, I will not be back. Well, not only did I come back the next election cycle after they spent over a million bucks to unseat me in an assembly seat, um, I came back um, beating the competitor by like 30 points. And, and I'm in a Democrat district as a Republican. So understand, um, the people are hearing it. Now we've got to do the same thing in the congressional race. And a lot of the marijuana people need to know that I did stand with them and now I need them to stand with me. If they can't vote for me because they're not in Congressional District 3, write a check and send it in to www.votefiori.com. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. I hope that message is well received. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. So, and if you'd like to meet uh, Michelle, tomorrow you're doing a, out in Boulder City, you're we doing are. a meet and greet, right? We're doing a meet and greet in Boulder City at the um, Elaine um, Smith Center. Uh, yeah, at the Elaine at Smith. At 700 Wyoming Street. We'll put it up on our Facebook page. And uh, if you're interested in going out there, check it out and come on out and meet Michelle in person. So. Yeah, please pop by and have some pasta and wine and cannolis with me. Wonderful. And, and I'd, yeah. I'd just like to close on the fact that, you know, being so plainly spoken uh, you, and controversial, you, the mainstream media and the, and the mainstream party tries to paint you uh, in a very unfair way as Without an extremist and, and as somebody who, who can't be trusted. But I, I hope that our listeners today have seen uh, or uh, that you are very common sense, center of the road, mainstream America on yes. a lot of these positions. Yeah. And we can disagree on, on, on any number of things, but certainly there would be a lot of sense in having someone in Congress like yourself. I wish you the best of luck in your primary and hope you make it through to the November election. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. That's right. And in other uh, events we have coming up uh, tomorrow, uh, 10 a.m. at the UNLV Hank Greenspun Center, uh, the Grove is hosting Breaking Barriers to MMJ Research. Uh, there's going to be Dr. Sue Sisley is going to be there speaking. We have uh, uh, Tick Siegerbloom is going to be there, uh, Patricia Farley, and Eugene Monroe from the NFL uh, just recently came out and... Uh, favor of cannabis we have patients choice coming up this saturday check it out on our facebook then on sunday we have our 
we can potluck and fundraiser for our good friend Dabber Dennis, who is in the hospital still. He's doing well. I just visited him this week, so we're uh, raising some money to help him out. Then next next week we have first friday on friday june 3rd uh we'll be out there selling our dope soaps and socks and then las vegas hemp fest on saturday june 4th so uh, look it all up it's all on our website www.wecan702.org if you're interested in supporting michelle it's a uh, boat so and with that it's been a great show and we'll see so you much. all next week thank, thank you, you thank you for having me